Thanks, Noah. <laughs> Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1, and we'll explain why in a minute, chapter 1. But it's always exciting in the life of a church to launch a new sermon series. And by the way, Pastor Garrett, uh, I appreciate that you said we're only going to be in this a couple months. That's a good one. <laughs> at least three, okay, at least three. We're going to allow the Lord to lead us through the Sermon on the Mount, but it's going to take us several weeks, and uh, it's exciting. You know, if you were to just read through the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, it would take you about 10 to 15 minutes, and one thing I just want to make a promise to you today, I will never go that short, okay? Just putting that out there, but there's, it's a condensed message from our Lord and Savior that's recorded for us in Matthew. Uh, a Cliff Notes version is in Luke, but we're going to spend some time going through this because it, it is an amazing sermon and the longest recorded sermon of Jesus in all of Scripture, so we're going to spend some time going through it. And if you're new with us, we had gone through Genesis chapters 1 through 11, and then we went through Malachi chapters 1 through 4, kind of bookended the Old Testament. And we just finished up with our discipleship initiative of gather, grow, and go. And as I was praying through where the Lord was leading us, as we seek to be the hands and feet of Christ, what better place to go than Jesus' most famous, longest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. It's going to teach us a lot of things. It's not going to be easy, but I promise you it's going to be fruitful because the Word of God never returns void. And my challenge for you is this. We have but a blip of time on Sunday morning to cover all of this. Would you join me in studying this each and every day as you do your quiet times, read the Sermon on the Mount, look at commentaries, look at different pastors that preach these messages, and just to give you a full scope of what's happening here because it's hard to do in just our short time on Sunday. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to begin this amazing study. Heavenly Father, we, we come to you this morning, just so thankful to be together, to open your word where all of truth is found. And so, God, I just pray for each person that's here. God, thank you for bringing them. Thank you for them being here. And, God, I just pray that you would speak to them through the power of your word as we study Matthew chapters 5 through 7 today and in the coming weeks. May you receive the glory of it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, this morning... We're, we're going to talk about Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 mostly, but as with anything, we can't just jump in in the middle of the gospel of Matthew without providing some context. So that's why hopefully your Bible is open right now to Matthew chapter 1. But I want us to be aware that long before the gospel of Matthew was written, the Sermon on the Mount began clear back in the book of Genesis, okay? And it is amazing, as I've studied this week, to see how all of God's word ties in together. But we can't just jump in in, in Matthew 5 because so much happens. And as we go through this, we must keep it in the front of our minds that Matthew is writing this to a Jewish audience. Matthew's whole purpose in writing this gospel was to show the Jewish people that believed the Torah... Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy as gospel, his whole purpose was to show them that Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of the law and that he is the Messiah that has came. So, for context, Genesis chapter 3, we all remember what happened, the fall of mankind. God created everything perfectly. He placed Adam and Eve in the garden and he said, you can do whatever you want. Don't eat from that one tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what did they do? They did the same thing that you and I would do. They went straight for the tree and they ate. And that changed human history forever because now sin has entered and death through sin. So we are all, every person that has ever been born besides Jesus Christ has a sin nature. And because of that, we are at enmity with God. We are separated from God. But Genesis 3.15, God gives us this first gospel. He, he 
looked at the serpent, and he said, Serpent, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall crush your head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. This is a foreshadowing of the first gospel message. He's saying there's going to be one coming that's the seed of the woman that's going to crush your head eventually. So the whole Old Testament is a playing out of Satan versus God with Satan trying to crush the head or crush the Messiah. He's trying to take out the one that God had promised to come. Don't believe me? Read Genesis chapter 4, the very next verse. Satan is like, okay, is Abel going to be the seed of the woman? Is Abel the Messiah? What did the serpent do? He said, Cain, take him out. Cain took him out. And then on and on and on is this battle between the seed of the woman and the serpent. So Genesis chapter 5 gives us this beautiful genealogy of ten generations from Adam to Noah, saying the seed of the woman has, there's a remnant. We have preserved the seed of the woman. Then in Genesis chapter 11, from Noah to Abraham. And then we flip the page to the New Testament, and what does Matthew do? In Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, he ties in Genesis to the Messiah. Let's read it. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He, right off the bat, he's saying, look, Jewish people, David was not the Messiah. You thought he was, but he's not. Abraham was not the Messiah. You thought he was, but he's not. Verse 2, Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac wasn't him. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob didn't turn out to be him. Jacob was a deceiver. Jacob was the father of Judah. And then in verse 17, he sums it all up. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14. From David to the deportation to Babylon are 14. And from the deportation of Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. So if you and I are going to write something to convince people, we're probably not going to start off with our family tree. But Matthew knew that he had to, to make the framework here of the Jewish people understanding this was God's plan from the jump. He had this figured out from the beginning. He knew that the Jewish people were going to come back at him with this, so he starts with the genealogies. Aren't you glad we didn't read all of Matthew chapter 1? Okay. All right. But look, look, look at Matthew chapter 1. We just read verse 17. Look at verse 18. Look at that. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. He immediately tells us who the seed of the woman is, who the Messiah is. And then Matthew chapter 2, what happens? Mary and Joseph flee to Egypt. Why did they flee to Egypt? Because the serpent was trying to take out the seed of the woman. Herod said, I want every boy killed under two years old. He was after Jesus. But God, created, God had a plan, and he allowed them to flee to Egypt. Jesus was fine. And then in chapter 3, who comes on the scene? This man that was prophesied in Malachi as the forerunner for Christ. His name is John the Baptist. And John the Baptist shows up and says, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. John the Baptist baptizes Jesus, symbolizing the launch of his earthly ministry in a sense. And then in chapter 4, what happens? Jesus and Satan have a showdown in the wilderness. By the way, how many days was Jesus in the wilderness? Anybody remember? Forty days. How many years did Israel wander in the wilderness? Forty years. It's like God knows what he's doing. It's amazing. Jesus is all throughout the Old Testament, and that's just more proof of it. Matthew chapter 4. So Jesus begins his ministry there in verse 12. Then Jesus calls his first disciples in verse 18. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And then in verse 23, as Noah just read, Jesus' ministry in Galilee began. And then we get to chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. So that's the plan. And today, I want to set the table for us as we study this for the next several weeks. That's why we're only going to cover these first two verses. However, 
it's so important that we have that foundation. So keep those things in mind as we uh, continue our study here. But let's just jump in. I've got three points. We're going to move through these fairly quickly. Number one, Jesus saw the crowds. And again, I got this straight out of Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, it, because it says this, when Jesus saw the crowds. There you go. Jesus saw the crowds. Now, it's important for us to remember, and, and we can't skip by this, because we can often read through Scripture and say, okay, you saw the crowds, that's great. But remember what the end of Matthew chapter 4 said. Jesus was going all throughout Galilee. He was uh, healing people of all kinds of diseases and sickness, and the word was spreading all throughout the region. Okay, and then verse 25 in chapter 4, it says, large crowds followed him. So Jesus, well, it, it, he was known. Everybody was flocking to him. What is he going to do next? He is, he is performing some crazy miracles. I want to go and see what is going on. And then I want to take us to Matthew chapter 9, because this is later on in Jesus' ministry. It says this about the crowds. Jesus was going through all the cities, all the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And here it is. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them. Because they were distressed and dispirited like a sheep without a shepherd. So if that doesn't speak to the heart of our Christ, I don't know what does. He looked at the crowds and he had compassion on them. Why did he have compassion? Because he knew that they were lost. They were believing in a law that could never get them to heaven. So Jesus had compassion on them. And that's Jesus' ministry. He had compassion on people. He was going throughout all of Galilee, teaching and preaching the kingdom of God. So he saw the crowds next. He went up on the mountain there in verse 1. Now, this is interesting, and this is where we get the title, Sermon on the Mount. I don't know who originally did that, but they're as creative as I am, okay? But the Sermon on the Mount is because Jesus saw the crowds, and he probably tried to get away from them, in a sense, because he went up on a mountain. Now, this is symbolism. Remember where Moses was when God gave him the Ten Commandments and the law? Up on a mountain. Again, Matthew is teaching a Jewish audience that this is the Christ, the Messiah, that is coming to fulfill all of that. So there's some symbolism there by going up on the mountain. There's also, the, the, no doubt, Jesus was probably trying to get some rest. In chapter 4, he was preaching and teaching and healing and just ministering to the people. He was probably trying to get some rest and, and get away from the masses of the people. But I think there's another reason, and it's not explicitly said here, but I think Jesus went up just to see who would follow him. Just to see, do you really want to hear what I have to say? Now, the location of this, and we've got a couple pictures for you. The location of where Jesus was was on the very north, northern edge of the Sea of Galilee. That's not a great picture. However, okay, so the, the Sea of Galilee is the blue part, okay, for those of you that need a little bit of help. The rest of it is land area around it, but at the top, you can kind of see Capernaum, right, in the north. And if you go to the left, it's, it's a little icon called the Church of Beatitudes. There is actually a Roman Catholic church there to this day, and they built it in the spot that they thought was uh, the location where Jesus was. So I, I hope these pictures can, can kind of show you the landscape a little bit of what is there. So this is way off in the distance. You can see the Church of the Beatitudes. So this is the middle of the sea looking north, and that somewhere on that hill was likely where Jesus walked up, sat down, and taught the Sermon on the Mount. We have one more picture there. There's the Church of Beatitudes looking out onto the Sea of Galilee. By the way, how many of you have been to Israel? Okay, I just want to say I'm jealous. I want to go so bad because it just makes this come alive. So, uh, Pastor Garrett, maybe we need to do a mission. There's people that don't know Jesus in Israel, right? Let's go evangelize them. <laughs> okay, 
Sea of Galilee. That's where this happened. So next, at the end of verse 1, or, or on in verse 1, it says, uh, Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountain, and after that, he sat down. Now, Jesus didn't sit down because he was tired, although he probably was tired, but he sat down because that was the posture of the teacher in that day. The rabbi would sit down, and the church or the congregation would stand up. And so I thought we would just try that this morning. So we're going to do that. I'm kidding. We're not going to do that. But... But that is how they would teach in those days. The, the rabbi would sit, the church would stand, the disciples would stand up, and um, that's how it went down. But who was in the crowd? Now, this is important because it says Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and he sat down. Now, we're going to read here in just a moment that Jesus is primarily speaking to his disciples here, but there's no doubt there was a bunch of people within hearing distance of his voice. The, the number one was the disciples. The disciples were likely there. Now remember, only four of the disciples had been called to this point in the Gospel of Matthew. And it wasn't until chapter 9 that, God call, that Jesus calls Matthew to follow me. So we don't know who was there, but it was likely others that ac accepted Christ as their Savior that wanted to learn more, not just the apostles or the 12 disciples. There's also people that were just curious. Who is this guy doing all this stuff? Who is this guy that can heal the sick and raise people from the dead and feed multitudes with two loaves of bread and five fish? Who is this person? There's probably people just looking for a free lunch or a free handout. Maybe they were looking for a political leader. And that was very likely because Matthew's gospel was recorded around 80 to 90 A.D. is when, math, is when most Bible scholars believe that this was recorded. Well, there was a significant thing that happened in A.D. 70. It was the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And there was this army, this political juggernaut called the Romans. And they were the boss. They were in control of all things religious, cultural, and political matters of the day. So there was probably a whole bunch of people gathered around saying, is this the guy that's going to free us from the Romans? Is he going to overthrow their army? Man, I hope so. I want to go hear what he has to say. So you can imagine the disappointment from those people after Jesus is done with the Sermon on the Mount. However, there was a whole group of people that wanted Jesus to be that. Making it personal, may I ask you today, which one of these are you in? Which camp are you in? Are you truly a disciple of Jesus Christ? Are you just here because you're curious? Do you want to just learn more about who this Jesus is? Maybe you see the upcoming election and you hope Jesus overthrows both parties. I think we all do, but that's not the point here. Who is Jesus to you? And I'm excited that he tells us a lot about himself in this upcoming sermon that he's about to show us. Point number two, Jesus' disciples came to him. In verse one, at the very end, Jesus saw the crowds. He went up to the mountain. He sat down. His disciples came to him. Now, this is the very first time the word disciples is mentioned in the New Testament. Very first time. Um, and again, this would not be just limited to the 12 apostles. This would have been anybody that had placed their faith in Jesus up to this point. We don't know how many. There was likely hundreds, possibly thousands. But it was probably a smaller, smaller group. But anyway, um, but we know there are a lot of people there. Because Matthew chapter 7, the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, says this. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. So we know that they had not heard preaching like this before. By the way, this is a word for us today. If you go to a church and the word of God is not opened and the pastor does not talk about Jesus Christ, and that's just not, that's, go somewhere else, okay? And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. If that ever happens here, go somewhere else, okay? Because the Word of God is all we have. Okay. But it's clear who came to him. Jesus' disciples came to him. And why did the disciples go to him? 
I was wrestling with this, and all I could come up with was this. Because that's what disciples do. <laughs> they go to Jesus. They go to the one in which they are being discipled by. Okay, that's where we vote with our feet, right? We are where we are being discipled. We are where we're getting whatever it is we want to get. And as a disciple of Christ, the word of God is where we should be. Okay, now... Today, what does that mean? How, how are we to go to Jesus? Well, it's simple. It means that we are drawn to his word, first and foremost. We're drawn to the word of God because this is how he speaks to us today. It means you're drawn to Bible teaching, to Bible preaching. You're drawn to people that believe the Bible and want to encourage you in your walk. Are there perfect Christians? Turn to your neighbor and say, nope. <laughs> Don't do that, really. You may not know them. That could have been very awkward. There are no perfect Christians. There is no perfect church because we are not perfect people. However, if we are going to be disciples, we must be drawn to the word of God and to God's people. All right? Jesus uh, gives each and every one of us also, he gives every one of us the invitation to come to him. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. John chapter 7, verse 37 says, Jesus stood up and he cried out, If anyone thirst, come to me and drink. John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father, God the Father, except for those that come through me, Jesus said. So Jesus invites us all to come to him, that's his message of hope. And even after we're saved, even after we have been born again by the blood of the cross, we must continue to come to him. Not because we need to be saved over and over. Salvation is a one-time thing when through grace alone, when you put your faith in Christ alone, that's how salvation happens. But we must continue to come to Christ because it's this thing called sanctification. We're never to be left to our own accord we're always to be growing in our fear and our admonition of the lord so salvation is not a lot of things it's not walking an aisle in a baptist church it's not going to church it's not doing this or that salvation is repenting of your sins and believing that jesus is the christ the son of god that is salvation but we must continue as disciples of jesus to come to him and then thirdly, Jesus taught them in verse 2. It says, I love this. I love how Matthew is, is just so descriptive here. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying. Like, like Matthew is saying, this is not something that I have made up on my own. I am writing down what I am observing Jesus doing. He sat down, he opened his mouth, and he began to teach. It, this is profound stuff. Now, if you have a red, how many of you have a red letter edition? Okay, several of you. The red letters in those editions are representative of the words of Christ. Okay, and, and I love that. It's easy to see, okay, this is Jesus speaking. And the whole Sermon on the Mount, except for the very couple of verses and the very final verses are all red letter. It's just Jesus giving us the knowledge, giving us uh, his, his way as we should live as disciples of him. But I want to caution us too, that, if, that 2 Timothy chapter 3 is very clear, that all scripture is God-breathed. Because there are some churches and some belief systems out there that only believe the red-letter words. And that's not good, church. Every word of God is useful. And it's just as important as the red letter words. However, when they're red, we should really pay attention to them, right? All right, it's the longest teaching discourse in the New Testament. A shorter version, as I mentioned earlier, it's found in Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 49. Jesus talks eight times in this sermon about the kingdom of heaven. Praise God. He talks five times about righteousness. And I'm excited to dive into those two subjects more in depth in the coming weeks. I read a commentary by John Scott. Wonderful 
Bible theologian. And he says, if I were to describe the Sermon on the Mount, it would be this, counter culture, counter culture. Jesus shows up on the scene and says, I don't know what you've been living like, but it's wrong. Here's how you should live. It's the same thing that we do today. It flies in the face of modern thought process, of modern thinking. It's the opposite, really. Jesus is saying that my followers will be so unlike the rest of the world that you can't mistake who they are. That's what Jesus is going to challenge us with. Every single paragraph, every single teaching is a contrast between how the world acts and how followers of Christ should act. It's going to step on your toes. So wear your steel toe boots next week. It's going to get good. The world doesn't understand this sermon, friends. They don't understand this sermon. Some say that the Sermon on the Mount is all we need. We don't need the rest of the Bible. It's the way to salvation. If we can just follow what Jesus says, we can just follow the rules that Jesus laid out in the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to be golden. We'll be in the kingdom of heaven someday. <laughs> Not true. Things like this are what they're talking about. And I'm excited to dive more into these in the coming weeks. You've heard it said, Jesus said, you've heard it said, you shall not commit murder. But I tell you, don't be angry or you're guilty. You've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, don't even look at a woman in lust or you've committed adultery. You've heard it said, you'll, you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those that persecute you. He is turning their world upside down with things like this. He says, don't store up for yourself treasures on earth. Don't worry about your life. Don't worry about tomorrow. Turn the other cheek when somebody smacks you. Go the extra mile. Don't be a hypocrite. How is somebody supposed to keep these laws? It's impossible, and that's the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount. It's to say, you will never be able to keep the law. It is only by justification through what Jesus did on the cross that we can have salvation. He's doubling down and saying, these are not achievable. These are not achievable. John Scott, who I referenced earlier, he said this. He said, the Sermon on the Mount is probably the best-known part of the teachings of Jesus, though arguably it is the least understood, and certainly it's the least obeyed. <laughs> Nail on the head right there. There's so many thoughts out there on this famous sermon. I would encourage you to study them, read about them. Some say, as I mentioned, it's all you need. You just need this set of rules to follow. Some think it's great for nations. If the nations of the world would just follow this, and that we would just pray for one another, that we would have peace. Some think it's just a nice way to live. We should just be kind to one another, which we should, but there's so much more to it than that. So when you hear the sermon taken out of context, or when somebody says, well, you're a Christian, you should just turn the other cheek, just remember that we can't expect non-Christians to act as Christians as we go throughout this world. Okay, so this is going to take grace upon grace upon grace, forgiveness after forgiveness after forgiveness. But I want to really finish with this. If you flip your page over to Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 8, it's almost a summary of the Sermon on the Mount. It says this, so do not be like them. <laughs> and he's talking about hypocrites. He's talking about people that are not like Christ. He basically says, don't be like them. It's the same message that God has given his people from the beginning of time. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 18. It'll be on the screen. You don't got to find it. Leviticus chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. Listen to what God says. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, I'm the Lord your God. You shall not do what is done in the land of Egypt where you lived, nor are you to do what is done in the land of Canaan where I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You are to perform my judgments and keep my statutes. To live in accordance with them, 
I am the Lord your God. This is Jesus' way of saying, I'm going to phrase it to you another way. Don't be like the world. And how are we to not be like the world? It's a tough ask, and it's a lifelong process, but we're in this together, and I'm going to help you through it, Jesus says. If you will be my disciple, if you will make my word a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path, The Sermon on the Mount was not given in order for people to know how to get to heaven. There's not a simple gospel presentation in any of this. But it's a sermon that was given as instructions for those that have given their life to Christ as a way to live their lives in light of what he's done for us. So as we work our way through in these next few weeks, I just want to give us a word of caution as we do this because it's so easy for us to think legalistically. If I do this, then God will do that. If I obey God, then he will bless me here. If this, then that. And that's not the way he works. It's easy for us, friends, and I am guilty first and foremost to call out other people's sins and not my own. Jesus talks about that. Take the log out of your own eye before they remove the speck out of theirs. But we have this notion that the sins that I don't commit are more heinous than the ones that I do. And therefore, we're going to be outspoken about those. We're going to be outspoken as I can be about homosexuality. How dare they think that they can be a homosexual and enter the kingdom of God? Take the log out of your own eye, church, and before you remove the speck out of theirs. Because there is forgiveness at the foot of the cross for all who call, who repent, and place their faith in Jesus Christ. Let's refrain from legalism. It's easy for us to say, well, the Christian on the other side of the aisle, or the Christian that I just met, they're not as committed as I am. Where are they? they? They weren't here for two weeks in a row. Where are they? Pastor Garrett, you call them. Go call them and find out where are they? what is more important than church. Right? This is what I'm saying, church. What is Jesus' ministry? Love the people, and through loving the people, God will work. It is God who brings the conviction, not you and I. It is God who does this. Now, should we reach out to people we haven't seen? Absolutely. Ask them, hey, what can I be praying for you about? We missed you. We missed your sweet family. But let's do it in love. Legalism is a dangerous, dangerous thing. Next thing is, this is not something that we do. These lists of things that Jesus lists out, these are not things that we do for God. It's something that God does through us. And how do we conform? Get in the word. I don't know how many times I've said that up to this point this morning, but it's so important that the way that God changes us is through his word. Will you join me in study? I was so encouraged. A friend that I used to work with at Geiger years ago, he texted me because he just saw that our last sermon series had been done. He said, what, what are you going to go through next? And I said, Sermon on the Mount. And he said, he doesn't even go to this church, but he said, I'm going to use the Sermon on the Mount as my daily quiet time, and I'm going to watch you on YouTube and I'm going to walk through this with you. I'm like, praise the Lord. That is amazing. Now, I'm not saying that that's what you got to do, but I'm just saying let's walk through this together. Let's study this hard. Let's dig in to every word of this Sermon on the Mount because it is transformative. Lastly, the Sermon on the Mount will make little sense to you if you are not a disciple of Jesus Christ. And that's how I want to end. We have an amazing opportunity right now to jump into Jesus' teaching to his disciples. But friends, you got to be a disciple. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ today? If he is calling you by name, do not wait to repent and believe. What better time than now? as we launch out into this, to really take inventory of your life, to say, am I truly a disciple of Jesus Christ? 
Do I know him? Do I love him? If there was a Chiefs game across the street right now, where would you be? <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I, I missed it. I hope you said here. Okay, all right. But that's what I'm talking about. Who is your Lord? Is it Christ? I pray that it is. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your word. God, thank you for these people that have come this morning eager to hear a word from you. God, desiring to study your word, desiring to deepen their relationship with you. God, what a privilege it is to be part of your church here in Baser, Kansas in the year 2024 with everything that's going on around us, with the election coming up in November, with the, the mess of our society, calling good evil and evil good, with just the little everyday things in life that can trip us up. God, we thank you for your word that draws us back to you so that we can recalibrate our compass on what truly matters. Father, we thank you for what you're doing here in this church. God, it is amazing to see. God, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to pour out on this place, that it would continue to pour out on us individually and collectively for our leadership, for our Sunday school teachers, for our kids' leaders. Lord, help us to stay in step with your word every, for every, everything that we do, every little thing, so that we can sit back and watch you grow in discipleship, grow in the knowledge of your word, so that we can make a bigger impact here in Baser and all around the world God, you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite